Assessments. The process of collecting, quantifying, and qualifying student performance. Teachers use assessments as checkpoints for understanding, to see if there are roadblocks to success and to give students an opportunity to see where they feel comfortable and where they are still lacking understanding. The two most traditional assessments, formative and summative. Well, formative. They are merely checkpoints along the way to test for understanding. Summative are cumulative and often more formal. Examples of formative assessment. You got the self-reflection. I mean, self-reflections, peer reflections, pretest, concept maps, graphic organizers, giving students a chance to turn in a draft prior to grading, classroom work, listening in on partner work, homework, examples of summative assessments, quizzes and tests, running records for assessing early readers, state tests, projects, papers. These are summative, okay? And these are formative. Other types of assessments. You got the portfolio assessment, you got the open-ended assessment. Well, what is a portfolio assessment? It's a collection of student work. Portfolios show growth over a long period of time. Open-ended assessments. Well, they require students to explain their answer and often is more than one answer. These type of assessments encourage critical thinking analysis and evaluation because there's there's more within one answer norm referenced test it measures a test takers performance against another peers performance how do other students of his age perform with his skill norm reference test the nrt used to classify student learners for homogeneous groupings based on ability levels or basic skills into a ranking category. Norm reference test provide information about how the local test takes did compare to a representative sampling of national test takers. And now the criterion reference test measures the performance of a child skill acquisition. Has the child learned what she set out to learn? Examine specific student learning goals, specific, and performance compared to a norm group of student learners. Performance-based assessments found most commonly in standardized exams and breaks the skill down into various levels of proficiency, it's performance. How well has a child learned the information? Differentiated instruction. Finding the instructional practice that matches your students' unique learning styles. When creating your instructional practices, it is important to refer to Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy recognizes the various levels of understanding ranging from basic recall to higher level of understanding. See, you got remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. And create is the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy, the new version. Okay, using a variety of instructional practices materials and technologies will help your students foster critical, creative, and reflective thinking. 
the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy is create. In order to move your students through Bloom's taxonomy, you should use a variety of instructional practices, materials, and technologies. Authentic engagement. If you give your students new information and then allow traditional practice through worksheets, partner work, or homework, complete it. I mean, complete the unit with a project that brings the concept to life and allows for authentic engagement. When you do that, they grasp the, they grasp the concept better because they engage in it. They, they're, it's authentic. They have a better learning experience that way. Which activity could be labeled as authentic engagement? Well, a mock trial. Ms. Diaz, okay, yeah, not a worksheet, not think fair share, not start from a mock trial is more authentic. Okay, Mrs. Diaz's class is going to draw a topographical map of their neighborhood, their neighborhood. This type of activity is labeled off as authentic engagement. It is authentic because it's about their neighborhood. So, you know, it's more authentic. Howard Gardner, and he has to do with multiple intelligences. He's famous for that. He listed these as the basic, unique learning needs. First one, we got linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, kinesthetic, spatial, interpersonal, intrapersonal and naturalistic. So this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever. I think I, th I thought it was ten, but it's actually eight. Uh, never mind. Well, he's famous for multiple intelligences. Measurable objectives. Well, there are those you find in the state standards and in any summative assessment. What is a measure of object to? Find a summative assessment. Okay. Two of the most famous theorists, Lev Vygotsky and the other guy is John Dewey. Well, Lev Vygotsky, he examined how social interaction takes place in learning. A child learns in three phases. The first zone, independent work, what a student can do on his own. The second, this one is important, the zone of proximal development. The instructor aids the student to move him toward a higher level of thinking. And the third zone is the ideas that a child does not yet understand, but Lev Vygotsky is most famous for this one, the zone of proximal development. Then is John Dewey. Then there's John Dewey, okay? He discussed the theory of experience. This theory argues that humans learn from experiences and that past experiences influence how someone reacts and relates with new situations. Educators may call this background schema. Major educational philosophers include Dewey and Vygotsky. The zone of proximal development it has to do with Lev Vygotsky, of course. The instructor is aiding the student to move him her toward a higher level of thinking. When the instructor helps the student, that's the zone of proximal development. The student is getting assistance. That's what it means. So Lev Vygotsky is known for what? for the zone of proximal development. Let's keep going. Theory of experience. Uh, has to do with my friend right here, John Dewey, right? This theory argued that humans learn from experiences and that past experiences influence how someone reacts and relates with new situations. Educators may call this 
background schema. Short term objectives. You may set short term objectives for a primary grade that looks like this. By the end of the unit on money, students will be able to identify quarter, nickel, dime, and penny, explain their worth, and add at least two pieces of money to determine the sum. Short term objecti objectives should be specific to the task and use words such as explain, analyze, examine, and comprehend. The best purpose of setting short-term objectives could be to monitor students' progress and keep them on track for the long-term goals. Long-term instructional goals. They may be more abstract and deal with long-term concepts such as students will identify the letters of the alphabet through visual and auditory exercises and will be able to connect and comprehend the sounds to the appropriate letter 85% of the time. You see, that sounds more like a long-term instructional goal. Note the words identify, connect, and comprehend on this thing. Gloria Latson Billings. She coined the term culturally responsive teaching. She defines it as students must experience academic success. Students must develop and maintain cultural competence and students must develop critical consciousness through which they challenge the status quo of the student uh, I mean of the current social order all that mumbo jumbo basically it means connecting a student's home culture with their education and not expecting the same education to fit every student Culturally responsive teaching, connecting a student's home culture with their education and not expecting the same education to fit every student. A culturally responsive classroom begins with the tone of the teacher. Okay, a culturally responsive classroom begins with the tone of the teacher, da da da. The teacher sets the tone of the classroom, and her tone can be the beginning of a culturally responsive classroom, one that celebrates all students and their backgrounds. Background schema. In order to activate students' prior knowledge, or background schema, encourage activities that help a student to re-familiarize himself with what he already knows. And a useful graphic organizer Looks like this, a KWL chart. KWL chart. What I know, what I want to know, what I learned. KWL chart. See? That's what that is. The purpose of activating background schema, okay? What is the purpose of activating that schema? It helps to give the student a foundation of familiar concepts with which to build new information upon. Let me read that again. It helps to give the student a foundation of familiar concepts with which to build new information upon, okay? Background schema are the file cabinets where students scores information that he has learned previously. Activating this schema will aid a student in understanding new information because, the, because he can connect it to information that he already knows. And 1.9, real quick. Jean Piaget. SPCF. What is that? Sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, formal, formal operational. 
Jean Piaget believes that children go through four stages of cognitive development. SPCF, one, two, three, four, okay? First one is sensory motor, from zero to two years old. Children develop ob object permanence. Pre-operational, two to seven years old. Children exhibit pretend play and are egocentric. Three, concrete operational. From 7 to 11 years of age, children think logically about concrete concepts. Egocentrism begins to disappear. And the last one, formal operational from 11 above, process of thinking abstractly. When a student is in the concrete operational stage, they will be able to think logically about concrete concepts. Children begin to think logically about concrete concepts between the ages of 7 11. And that is the concrete operational stage. Response to intervention, the RTI. A school wide model that will intervene where a child needs it, and it is often intensive. The, tr the three tires are as follows. Primary, in primary intervention, finding out who needs support. Strategic intervention is supplemental intervention. Additional intensive intervention, intensive interventions. In a response to intervention model, a student moves through various interventions and if he, she needs more support, he, she moves into the next tire. The purpose of response to intervention in this intensive three tire model, a child has a chance to catch up where he struggles. RTI is a three tire model that includes small group, individualized instruction and is an is used to catch up students who are struggling academically. Last one right here. Intervention strategies based on student needs. Read aloud, small group instruction, response to intervention, after school help, specialized reading programs, gain additional parent support, and then phonics, the connection between sounds and the letters on a page. And that is chapter one. I'll pause right here. In the learning environment, in a face-to-face -face setting, well, use the assets to the best of your ability. Survey your classroom. See how you can best use your space. Put your desk where you can see your students. Give students a place to put their own things and be autonomous of their own piece of the classroom. Use the Socratic method when managing when managing class dialogue move the conversation along with another question handle errors by turning the question back around to the class that's the socratic method socratic method refers to class discussion that encourages teachers to turn questions back around at students the Socratic method refers to the, I mean, refers to when the teacher acting as a facilitator asks an open-ended question and guides her students through the answer by asking more questions and furthering the thoughts. Learning environment, virtual setting. Often, Online classes struggle with creating a sense of togetherness since there isn't any time for the back and forth dialogue available in traditional classroom. Online classes lend themselves to self-starters. Your students may not need much hand-holding in terms of completing assign assignments. So you can focus on other priorities. That's the virtual setting. What is the challenge faced by an online instructor? Well, keeping a sense of community within the class. 
Because of the unique form that online classes provide, an instructor must work hard to create a sense of community through group work, discussion forums, or, vir or virtual classrooms. Socratic method. Use the Socratic method when managing class dialogue. Move the conversation along with another question and resist giving answers to open-ended questions. Handle errors by turning the question back around to the class. Classroom management. Managing your classroom is most likely the single most important job that you have. If you do not gain the respect of your students, you will not be able to create a relationship with them, and then you will not be able to teach them anything. Preemptive strategies are the key here. Try to predict the issues your students will have and create management plans around them. Why will classroom management plans be crucial to student success? Well, students will know behavioral, behavioral expectations, which will help them to focus more on their academics. Preemptive classroom management plans will take the guesswork out of student behaviors so they can focus on their academic success. It will also help students make better behavior choices since they know the classroom rules and consequences. Therefore, they will be less likely to act out in class. Extrinsic motivation. Okay, Mrs. Cameron is having a hard time motivating John, a fifth grader, to do his work. She notices that he loves to talk about airplanes. She tells John that if he gets five stickers for listening this week, he can bring in one of his airplanes to share on Friday. What strategy is Miss, Mrs. Cameron employing? Well, of course, extrinsic motivation. Communicating high expectations to all students. Be cognizant of creating high expectations for all students, regardless of background. Some research has shown that teachers may have lower expectations for students who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So you have to communicate high expectations to all students. Mr. Brown is taking inventory of initial benchmark testing in reading. He notices that many of his students who come from low socioeconomic backgrounds are below average in reading. Well, he closes the data set and draws a conclusion that most likely these students will not improve much this year because they will not respond to his teaching strategies. What is the problem with what? Mr. Brown is doing. He is stereotyping his students and labeling them based on socioeconomic background. That's the problem he has. Accommodate the needs and backgrounds for all students. Okay, accommodate for all students. Create a classroom with many visual opportunities for learning. Consider that your students will be coming from different backgrounds and unique family situations. Encourage group seating to promote community. Allow your students to bring their home literacies to school. Allow them to talk in their language and work in their comfort zone while still educating them in standard-based learning. Which is an example of allowing a child to bring her home literacy to the classroom? Which one? Creating assignments that will speak to a child's home strength, whether that is storytelling, music, or drawing. Notice what your students excel at and create 
standard based assignments that allow them to use these skills in schools. Marrying the two environments will motivate students, create intrinsic motivation and prep them for success. So that is an example of allowing to a child to bring their home literacy to the classroom. You will create intrinsic motivation. When communicating with parents for whom English is not the primary language, you should provide materials whenever possible in their native language. You should use an interpreter. You should provide the same communication as you would to native English speaking parents. Apply techniques for modeling oral and written communication skills. Think about how you present new material to all learners not just the auditory ones. We may have a tendency to give oral directions, but that will not sink in for our visual or kinesthetic learners. Asking to students to repeat your directions in their own words, you are teaching active listening. What is active listening? Asking students to look at you when you speak and then repeat back what you said in their own words. Let me pause it right here. Encourage innovation, foster a safe climate, and support for all students. Students need to feel comfortable and safe to learn. Create that safe and secure environment. Discuss your, uh, discuss your classroom culture. Create rules that use positive language. Encourage students to ask questions, but be aware of the shy ones. Have a confidence box for students who need help, but can't bring themselves to ask because they're too shy for it, okay? So have a confidence box for them. Appropriate class, um, I'm tired already. An appropriate classroom rule would be hands on your own body. Always use positive language when creating rules. Don't, don't use, uh, don't write up rules like don't do this, don't do that, because that's negative language. Hands on your own body, okay? Use positive language when creating rules in order to create a safe and secure environment. Why would a teacher use a confidence box? Well, obviously to invite anonymous classroom communication. Okay, that's specifically for the shy students. This will encourage shy students to share their feelings and frustrations. Student-centered learning environment. An ideal student-centered classroom. Okay, in an ideal student-centered classroom, the teacher acts as a facilitator. Students learn based on their interest and learning styles. Students are taking the lead in their learning and reaching the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy where they will be synthesizing, evaluating, and creating. Teachers, when acting as facilitators, can bring technology to aid students with their learning. In idea, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, okay? It is a law that ensures that children with special needs receive the services they need to succeed. They are entitled to a free, appropriate public education, F-A-P-E, free, appropriate public education. And the details are often found on their individualized education plan, their IEPs, Individualized Education Plan. Individualized Education Plan, IEP. IEPs 
or individualized ed education plan include services that students need in the classroom and on assessments. And this may also include assistive technologies. Assistive technology can help students who struggles with auditory processing, speaking, writing, or has a physical disability. The purpose for assistive technology is to give the student a chance to complete his work independently. Assistive technologies aid in placing a student in the least restrictive environment, LRE, least restrictive environment, which is part of IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, okay, and states that a student should learn in the least restrictive environment he can handle. Okay, got it, and voila, done with all the flashcards. Extrinsic Motivational Strategies The student is motivated to succeed because of outside factors. An example of an extrinsic motivator would be a class reward system. You know, when you offer students um, some kind of reward, something extrinsic, the students are not motivated by themselves. You have to offer them something. That's an example of an extrinsic motivational strategy. For example here, a class marble jar is an example of an extrinsic motivator and also a class reward system. If a student is intrinsically motivated, they work to achieve personal goals. That's the difference between intrinsically and extrinsic. Okay, Intrinsically motivated students will work to achieve personal goals. Intrinsic, in, Intrinsically motivated students learn because they have personal goals to achieve and their motivation comes from within within themselves, okay? That's the difference. We're on th uh, chapter 3 on the flashcards. Intrinsic motivational strategies. Motivation to succeed comes from within. An example of an intrinsic motivator would be to allow the students to set goals for himself or herself and talk him or her through reaching those goals. Research indicates that as teachers become significantly more enthusiastic, students exhibit increased on task behavior. Of course, if the teacher is motivated, the students will too. In a success-oriented classroom, mistakes are viewed as just a natural part of the learning process. With this approach, students have the opportunity to learn by correcting mistakes rather than seeing the mistake as a penalty, which is, you know, that it motivates students better. The teacher responds, yes, that is correct, to a student's answer. What is this an example of? Well, that's a simple, positive response. It's not an academic praise, because academic praise is more specific. Academic praise is a group of specific statements that give information about the value of the response or its implications. For example, a teacher using academic praise would respond, that is an excellent analysis of Twain's use of the river in Huckleberry Finn. Whereas simple positive response to the same question would be, that's correct. That's correct is just a simple, positive response. That's correct is not academic praise. Just to clear that out. We got, oh, 3.2 right here. 
developing content literacy. Okay, literacy is not a reading teacher's problem. Not only the read uh, the reading teacher's problem. Every teacher is developing literacy regardless of subject, whether it's math, whether it's science, whether it's physical ed, whatever the subject, every teacher is developing literacy, okay? Activating previous knowledge is an excellent way to begin developing content literacy. KWL charts are useful graphic organizers for activating background schema. Uh, the KWL charts are those um, what you know, what you want to know, and what you and what you learned. Um, yeah, there's an example of that chart here somewhere. I'll show later in the video. Content literacy includes being effective speakers, effective writers and readers, being able to problem solve and investigate, inquiry-based instruction, where students are given a chance to engage in the literacy-based research activities for that particular content area. Often, these group activities have real-world authentic focus. Comprehension, when the reader can ascribe meaning to the text. Well, he comprehends, okay? That's what it is, basically something simple as that. So again, what is inquiry-based instruction? It's a type of instruction where students are on a quest to find information in authentic context. Inquiry-based instruction involves students working through research projects that have an authentic result. This type of instruction can be useful across all contexts and is often literacy-based. Mr. Rogers described his educational philosophy as eclectic, meaning that he uses many educational theories to guide his classroom practice. Why is this the best approach for today's teachers? Well, today's classroom, today, I'm sorry, I got tongue twisted again. Today's classrooms are often too diverse for one theory to meet the needs of all students. Educators must be able to draw upon other strategies if one theory is not effective. See? So if one theory doesn't work, try another one. That's what it means by eclectic, using many educational theories to guide a classroom practice. Okay? And that is the best approach. If something doesn't work, try something else because today's classrooms are too diverse for one theory to meet the needs of all students, of course. Efficient use of time includes punctuality and management transition. C3.3. The mean is the average score. Standard deviation determines how spread out the data is and how close the scores are to the mean. Interquarrel range is the middle 50% of a data set, or the 25th to 75th percentile. Okay. This one, differentiated instruction. Finding the instructional practice that matches your students' unique learning styles. Using varied techniques and strategies to help students understand new concepts and review familiar ones. Two basic types of questions are basic recall and higher order thinking. Remember this one. The two basic types of questions are basic recall, just recalling, you know, remembering stuff, and higher order thinking, the only two, okay? And differentiated instruction is simply 
finding the instructional practice that matches your students' unique learning styles, okay? You're gonna use variety techniques and strategies to help students understand new concepts and review familiar ones. That's what it means. Okay, we were here and now we will continue. To address her students' preconceptions, Mrs. Diaz should, she should, she should make a KWL chart and also ask what prior experiences they have. A higher order thinking question, what was the theme? How do you know? It asks the students to use inference and draw conclusions. And those are two higher order thinking skills. Relate subject matter to life experiences and across disciplines. A student begins her learning with his, her life experiences. John Dewey. He's important right there. John Dewey explored the strong connection between experience and education in the constructivism theory. Jean Piaget noted in his discussion on cognitive development that we first learn what we experience and those experiences form our background schema. That's Jean Piaget. John Dewey has to do with constructivism, okay, and experience. Constructivist classrooms are considered to be student-centered. Student-centered classrooms are considered to be constructivist in that students are given opportunities to construct their own meanings into, onto new pieces of knowledge. An interdisciplinary teacher is a teacher who will relate one subject's topic with another, merging them together to create common themes. Okay, oh, that's easy. If a social studies teacher and an English teacher are working together in a unit that combines literature from World War II, Okay, we are still here in 3.5 because uh, video stopped. So, if a social studies teacher and an English teacher are working together in a unit that combines literature from World War II and the history of World War II, literature and, her and history, uh, this type of instruction is, of course, interdisciplinary teaching because Interdisciplinary teaching is when two teachers of different content areas unite to connect concepts across subjects. This strategy of teaching aids students in creating higher levels of understanding and prepares them for authentic learning. Okay? That is in interdisciplinary. We're done with that. 3.6. Higher order critical thinking skills. The higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy all have to do with higher order thinking skills. Analyze, evaluate, and create. That's right. Those are the higher ones. Analyze, evaluate, create. And create is the highest. If a student's if a student can do these things, she or he is reaching an advanced level of understanding. Uh, cooperative, no, no, cooperative, cooperative learning. Well, what is that? Is group work to teach students how to work together and learn from each other. That's what it is. Okay. Metacognition is important to a student development because it will help students learn how they learn and what they need to understand at a higher level. Metacognitive is when students think about their thinking. So how do I best learn this? 
That's being metacognitive. Thinking about your own thinking. Looking in your own self of how you best learn something. Okay? It's like me. Uh, I'm doing flashcards. I'm doing videos. Whatever it takes for me to learn this and pass this freaking test. That's I'm being metacognitive. And a little bit upset too. Because this will be the third time for me trying to take this test. 3.7. Appropriate technology for relevant instruction. There are many ways to appropriately bring technology into your lesson planning. Bringing units to life by having real conversations with real people is an excellent way to authenticate instruction. Authenticate, okay? Always talk about internet safety. Online photos are forever and stranger danger applies online just as it would it just as it would in real life, okay? How can a student tell if a website is useful for their research or not? Well, the website is going to have a reputable brand or organization behind it. Why are basic web searches not a great use of technology? Well, they are unfocused. They will take up too much valu valuable learning time. Teachers should include guided searches, such as WebQuest, to give students direction and filters in their research. 3.8. Differentiated instruction. Well, what is differentiated instruction? Well, it uses varied techniques and strategies, okay, to help students understand new concepts and review familiar ones. A teacher who practices differentiated instruction will challenge her students and will use their own background schema to help them understand the new material. A principal walks into Mr. Chavez's classroom. He notices that various centers are set up and students are working in small groups. At each one, of course. One group is creating a PowerPoint. Another group is sitting with Mr. Chavez and practicing fluency. One group is doing a scavenger hunt with the dictionary, of course. And another group is writing in their journal. The principal is observing which type of instruction? Of course, differentiated instruction. Okay? Students are doing many different things in the classroom. One with the PowerPoint, another one practicing fluency, the other ones are doing scavenger hunts. Well, all those things are differentiated instructions because the teacher is using a variety, you know, a variety of strategies to teach students the same concept. So they grasp it. Okay. Differentiated instruction. Differentiated instruction looks like this. Varied centers, varied tasks, students engaged and focused on many inquiry-based or student-centered activities. Differentiated instruction is inquiry-based. Rubrics. Rubrics aid in helping students to become metacognitive and self-reflective. Feedback can come in multiple forms. A teacher can write on the students' papers and quizzes, speak in conferences, conferences, or small groups, or can be given in the form of peer feedback and self-reflection. Okay? So that's what feedback is. A teacher can write on student papers, quizzes, uh, speak in conferences, small groups, or can be given in the form of peer feedback and self-reflection. Okay? You got that. And 
3.9. Okay, we're still 3.9. Feedback. Giving good feedback is not just about fixing the negative. It is also about pointing out the positive. Great job is not appropriate feedback. Feedback should be clear and detailed, positive and negative. So great job is just a simple positive response, right? And we're done with that, 3.10. Once you know what your students need, it is your job to differentiate your instruction to accommodate as many of, of your students as you can. The support staff is there to help you. Many schools will have resources Resources such as special ed teachers, reading specialists, speech and occupational therapists, and guidance counselors. You are not alone. Why should a general education teacher ask the support staff for help with students? Because support staff are trained to help a unique population of students. Support staff are trained to deal with specific populations of students and by collaborating with specialists, general education teachers can create activities that will be challenging but engaging to all of her very different students. And we're going to stop there. That is chapter three for you. We will continue with chapter four. Now we begin on 4.1, descriptive statistics. These include data such as mean, median, mode, standard deviation, range, and skewness. The mean, median, and mode, they are all part of the central tendency, that is, they give you an estimate of the center of your values, mean, median, mode. But they're all descriptive statistics. The mean, median, mode, standard deviation, range, and skewness. But the mean, median, and the mode are part of the central tendency. Okay? An example of a, a descriptive statistic would be standard deviation descriptive okay central tendency shows the mean median and mode mean median and mode all show measures of the estimate of the central values range and standard deviation measured the spread so how spread are the data that's the range and standard deviation. Mean, median, mode, central values, range and standard deviation, they measure spread, but they are all descriptive statistics. Got it? Got it. Inferential statistics. They are about drawing a conclusion about a population based on a random sample. This is where you may use probabilities to make an educated guess on future test scores. Analyzing data this way can help an instructor use past scores to determine how her students may score if she keeps her teaching the same. These sort of predictions are not always completely valid. But, you, know, you know, students, people change. So, so, An example of an inferential statistic would be probability. Mean, range, and standard deviation are all descriptive statistics. Probability is an inferential st statistic. 4.ative and summative assessments. 4.ative measures the progress of student skills and are often informal and done along the way of instruction. 4.ative assessments 
can give you excellent ideas of where your students stand in terms of their understanding. Summative are more form, uh, they are more formal and are usually done at the end of the unit. In choosing an appropriate assessment for students, a teacher should think about the following. Think about Garner's theory, think about the content thought, and think about Bloom's taxonomy. Garner's learning styles will help a teacher decide how she would evaluate her students. The teachers uh, the teacher needs to keep the content a priority. Okay? What did she teach? And then finally, she should be aware of the higher order thinking levels of Bloom's taxonomy to create questions for different levels of understanding. Sorry about this. Which of the following test items is not objective? Well, an essay, because uh, objective will be multiple choice, matching, and true-false. These three are objective. An essay, no. Essay is not considered an objective test because there is no single correct answer, unlike multiple choice, matching, and true-false. Essays are subjective. Assessment tools to monitor student progress. Okay, we got the benchmark testing. When you first begin a class, it's important to start with benchmark testing. This will give you a data baseline of where your students are so you can monitor progress throughout the year. Norm reference test. Measures groups of students against each other. That's the norm reference test. And then the criterion reference test measures if a student has achieved a certain skill, a specific skill. Okay, that's criterion. And then norms is measuring groups of students against each other. Okay. Using graphs, tables, and maps is considered to be a study skill. In studying, it is certainly true that it's that a picture is worth a thousand words. Not only these devices, I'm sorry, not only are these devices useful in making a point clear, they are excellent mnemonic devices for remembering facts. So yes, using graphs, tables, and maps is considered to be a study skill. Pictures help you out, okay? Graphics. If a teacher wants to measure if her students learn a specific skill, she would use this type of test. Criterion reference testing, because criterion is, goes to a specific skill. A criterion reference test measures if a student has learned what they set out to learn. It goes to specific, okay? The order of assessments is benchmark, formative, and then summative. Most teachers start out with diagnostic testing, which sets the beginning data set for the student, the benchmark test. During the instruction, a formative assessment can informally measure progress. Finally, a summative assessment will measure what the student has learned. Some teachers will take another benchmark at that point as well. Appropriate assessment to accommodate learning styles and varying knowledge levels of students. Use formative and summative assessments. Use your student's strength and knowledge levels when testing to various learning styles. Formative assessments are critical for process and for when the level of knowledge between students varies. When seeing the successful inclusion of students with disabilities, 
a variety of instructional arrangements are available. Successful inclusion, of course. All schools have policies and resources in place to aid in the inclusion of students with disabilities. Successful inclusion is possible when teachers employ these resources and maintain a positive attitude. All of the following are accommodation on statewide assessments, except take home test. Students are not allowed to talk about the test with peers and cannot bring it home to complete it. The others are allowed if mentioned in the IEPs. IEPs is Individualized Education Plan. That's an IEP. Who are your stakeholders? Of course, students, parents, administrators, support staff, your colleagues, all these are critical stakeholders in the outcome of student assessment data. Encourage students to be metacognitive. Did they set goals? Did they reach those goals? What, are, uh, what were their challenges? Data stakeholders include teachers, principals, students, etc., etc. All of the above are interested in the data created through standardized testing. Teachers, principals, and students have their own reasons for wanting to know where students thrive and where there are challenges. Use technology to organize assessment data. Line graphs show you how a group of information is connected and how it grows over time. You know what a line graph is. Bar graphs shows you comparisons across categories. And then a scatter plot is for two different lines of data and will show you the relationship between both, both sets. Mr. Brown wants to plot his students' data from two classes. Each class took a test and he wants to compare scores across the class to find the relationship. Which would be the best graph to do this? Well, a scatter plot, of course, because a scatter plot <clears throat> will show the relationship between two different sets of data just like we talked about right here. Scatter plot is for two different lines of data and will show the relationship between both sets. Of course, and that's what he wants to do. Organizing data. Your first step in organizing your data through technology is to use Microsoft Excel. In Excel, you can input your student scores and then through formulas find important descriptive st statistics such as the mean, median mode, standard deviation, intercore range, and skewness. Five point one professional development. Okay. It should be relevant, engaging, and ongoing relevant, engaging, and ongoing, and should allow teachers to have time to practice their new skills. When they learn something, they get training, they need to have time to practice their new skills. Often professional development is viewed as a one-time training, when in reality, an effective session doesn't stop when the first training is over. Instead, teachers practice, reflect, and learn from each other to make their training time count. Good professional development is, of course, ongoing, engaging, and self-reflective. Good professional development must be more than one session. It must be engaging to the needs of the teachers and allow time for self-reflection and improvement. Ways a professional can access his or her teaching strengths and weaknesses. Examining how many students are unable to understand a concept. 
asking peers for suggestions or ideas. Self-evaluation and self-reflection on lessons thought. Those are ways a professional can access his or her teaching strengths and weaknesses. You know, evaluate her, him herself. It is important for teachers to involve themselves in constant periods of reflection and self-reflection to ensure that they are meeting the needs of the students, which is the most important thing. A good reason to collaborate with a peer is to increase your knowledge in areas where you feel you are weak but the peer is strong. Collaboration with a peer allows teachers to share ideas and information. In this way, the teachers are able to improve their skills and share additional information with each other. Demographic data. It will tell you of the following except graduation rates is not has nothing to do with demographic. Demographic is more about student background, student language, parent education, but no no graduation rates, okay? Graduation rates are part of outcome data, not demographic data. Outcome data measures what students achieve. 5.2. Analyze and apply data informed research to improve instruction and student achievement. Okay. To gain appropriate data research, you should begin by giving multiple assessments. This should be multifaceted so you can catch students' strengths and weaknesses. Your data should include quantitative numbers-driven, and qualitative, experience-driven research. Meta-analysis is when you take multiple data collections and draw a conclusion from the multiple data points. Okay. When you analyze student data, what will you, what will you do with it? It can affect many of your decisions to what to teach, how or if to group students, which students should receive remedial work, or what your class objectives should be. Bubble students. They are constantly scoring right below the passing score. They could benefit greatly from more remedial instruction. Triangulated. Data should always be triangulated. That is, taken from multiple sources. Tri triangulated data includes data from multiple sources. Triangulated data is data from multiple sources. Qualitative data comes from experiences and stories. Quality. Quality, experience, stories. Qualitative data is personal and subjective and it comes from stories and experiences. The demographic data. Where do your students come from? What are their socioeconomic backgrounds? How old are they? What is their family life like? In collecting this type of data, you will learn things like language preference, parent education, and student characteristics. These answers will help you to form a basic idea of who your students are. Mm -hmm. Which of the following should not be a purpose of a parent-teacher conference? Of course, to establish a friendship with the child's parent. That sounds so dumb, right? The purpose of a parent-teacher conference is to involve parents in their child's education, address concerns about the child's performance, and share positive aspects of the student's learning with the parents. It would be unprofessional to allow the conference to degenerate into a social visit to establish friendships. Outcome data measures student scores. 
What did the students achieve? What was the mean and standard deviation? In analyzing this data, you will learn things like scores on tests, portfolios, graduation rates, employment rates, and scores on formative assessments. Of course, statewide exams count as outcome data. What are the three major types of data collection? Demographic, process, and outcome. The three types of data collection are demographic, process, and outcome. Okay. You got that, right? Outcome data, measure student scores, what did the students achieve, what was the mean and standard deviation. In analyzing this data, you will learn things like scores on tests, portfolios, graduation rates, employment rates, okay, and scores on formative assessments. Of course, statewide exams count as outcome data, outcomes, outcomes, you know, what they achieved. Process data. This is just as important as outcome data. What were the processes behind the data collection? Process data is usually collected through qualitative measures, which can include surveys, interviews, or observations. Process data. Okay, I left off in process data, so we will continue from here. Process data is collected through surveys, interviews, and observations. Process data examines the journey behind the data collections. And all of these measures are qualitative, quality, remember quality, which are ways to collect process data. What is the process, okay? <clears throat> Who are your stakeholders in a school community? Well, they include the parents, teachers, administrators and students they all bring their own home literacies and social cultural context to the educational environment if you have an english language learner ell student or students you may say you may send home parent letters in the native languages or if at all possible use interpreters okay just to provide that help mm, get stuck miss cameron has two students ah not miss cameron mister <laughs> mr cameron has two students in his seventh grade class whose parents are difficult to reach and the students are failing class the families do not have a working phone. What should Mr. Cameron next step be in trying to contact the parent? Well, send a note home and request a parent signature. Remember, it's seventh grade, okay? The child may not be picked up or dropped off each day. However, sending a note home with a seventh grader who is old enough to understand that, rep that responsibility should get a parent's attention. Encouraging diverse cultures is critical. Invite your students to use their home life to authenticate their school work. Be sensitive to the fact that some families may not understand or feel comfortable with you as a teacher because you have a different cultural or socioeconomic background. Challenges with ELL parents could include attendance at parent-teacher conferences, involvement in school events, access to the internet and or phone. Parents of ELL students have distinctive struggles. They may not understand the language or may not have the resources to attend. 
be cognizant and sensitive to those differences. Professional development. Four desired outcomes of professional development. Enhancing content knowledge. Enhancing quality teaching practices. Developing the leadership. Blah, blah, I said that wrong. Developing the leadership capacity. Building professional learning communities. In a professional development seminar, you may have the opportunity to bring home a deliverable. This could be a new lesson plan, a new manipulative teacher contact information. Professional development seminars are great opportunities for networking as well as learning new teaching strategies. Professional Network is a voluntary collaboration of professionals who share a specific purpose and want to have ongoing communication about broadening their views and education. Professional Learning Community, Professional Learning Community, PLC often made up of teachers who teach in the same grade level or the same subject area and may meet once a week during a free period designed for professional learning community time or after school. Action research. What is that? The opportunity for teachers to work together, together or independently, to create questions and through data collection, find the solution within their unique professional context and then reflect on this solution once it is implemented. What is action research? A teacher finds a problem in her classroom, researches solutions, and implements the best one. Action research is when a teacher finds a unique problem to her class, researches various solutions, and chooses the best one. Action research can be done independently or with a group. If you are acting as a facilitator in your classroom, your job will be to manage students as they, they problem solve, okay? Not you. It's not the teacher problem solving. They problem solve. You will still have a very active role in the classroom, but will you will not be just teaching through direct instruction. You're not going to be a direct instructor. You will give student projects, but will help them manage the challenges and be as involved as you need to be to keep them on task. But remember, they are problem solving. You just facilitate. They problem solve. Okay? When you act as a facilitator, students problem solve you just provide things for them okay and let them do the work and i'm going to stop there because now on we're on 6.1 this shall be a short chapter here 6.1 code of ethics the ultimate goal of teachers when they enter the profession of teaching is to provide a comprehensive education for all students by providing challenging curriculum and setting high expectations for learning. Student-centered learning environment. 
The goal is to provide the best opportunity for academic success for all students. Integrating the developmental patterns of physical, social, and academic norms for students will provide individual learners with student learning plans that are individualized and specific to their, to their skills, levels, and needs. To their skill levels and needs, okay? Physical, social, and academic norms. Okay. Let's move this thing away. Uh -huh. What developmental patterns should a professional teacher assess to meet the needs of the students? Well, we just spoke about it, talk about it. Social, physical, and academic developmental needs. Oh, developmental patterns, development, developing, developmental patterns, social, physical, and academic. The effective teacher applies knowledge of physical, social, and academic development patterns and of individual differences to meet the instructional needs of all students in the classroom. 6.2 Florida Code of Professional Conduct for Teachers Creating a safe learning environment and protecting students from any conditions that could be potentially harmful or cause degradation is the first obligation teachers have to students. Protecting a safe learning environment, okay? Anything that could be harmful or cause degradation is the first obligation teachers have to students, okay? You have to protect your students from everything. An educator certificate can be revoked or suspended if the following happens. Teacher fails to self-report within 48 hours to appropriate authorities as determined by the districts. Any arrest charges involving the abuse of a child now remember reporting doesn't doesn't mean you are admitting guilt but you have to self-report within 48 hours teachers must hold themselves to high standards when they engage in negative actions such as fighting with students they are violating all the following except fiscal, okay? They are violating ethics. They are violating professionalism and morals, not fiscal. Remember, teachers must hold themselves to high standards. When they engage in negative actions, such as fighting with students, they violate all of these, not fiscal, but they are violating ethics, professionalism, and morals. If you suspect child abuse, the state of Florida recognizes teachers as mandated reporters. Teachers are mandated reporters of child abuse in the state of Florida. Although you can report anonymously, mandated reporters of all physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect, all teachers are mandated reporters. You don't report you get screwed. Technology. Technology is a wonderful resource for students. Yes, yes, yes. It makes the world of research easily accessible. That is true. And can give students fantastic opportunities to broaden their scope of knowledge. However, the internet is a dangerous place. Yes, it is. AUP. Acceptable use policy. It will outline what the purpose of school technology is, what inappropriate sites look like, what students are and are not allowed to do on the computer, and what consequences will be if students violate the rules. So an AUP or an acceptable use policy 
it will state the following. It is a parent permission form to allow students to use school internet. It explains the purpose of school technology, what inappropriate sites look like, what students may do on the computer, and consequences for rule violations. The AUP is a school-wide technology form explaining the rules and often requires both parent and student signatures. 6.5 Student Records Student records are personal and confidential. They should be kept in locked cabinets or password protected if the records are electronic. A student's cumulative record will, op will often have information such as the student academic and disciplinary record, IEP, any academic or behavioral challenges he may have faced, medical records, notes from any counselors and or teachers. And they are private, okay? Student records will include all of the following except student preferences, but they will include medical records, they will include disciplinary records, and IEPs, which is Individualized Education Plan. They will not include, however, student preferences. Student records include formal evaluations and records of the student, but not things like their preferences. And that was 6.5. We're done. I'm going to pause it. Okay, what is a culturally responsive classroom? Well, basically it means that a teacher will consciously use her student's background to create her lessons. Okay, you're going to use your student's background to create the lessons. Additionally, a culturally responsive teacher will take the role of a facilitator, help her students become metacognitive and self-reflective, and teach them how to connect these new academic experiences to their own social and cultural backgrounds. Which classroom environment could be labeled as culturally responsive. Well, this environment, check this out. Desks in circles or patterns. Student work decorating the classroom. Not the teacher work, the student work decorates the classroom. Posters that feature multicultural students. Cultural artifacts and a classroom rule poster that students have created themselves, okay? A culturally responsive classroom belongs to the students with the teachers as facilitators. The classroom has many visuals that acknowledge this fact and celebrate diversity. Language comes in waves. Students may acquire social language first. They may not be able to communicate in a classroom, which is more formal language, until later, of course. Many lessons on making friends using manners or appropriate words for greeting a person can be beneficial to all students. But can help an ELL student feel comfortable in predictable social situations. Why would an ELL student acquire social language before academic language? Well, it's because social language incorporates more routines and predictable phrases. ELL students will learn social language faster than academic language because often academic language is full of new concepts and difficult vocabulary, whereas social language is filled with 
repetitive phrases, vocabulary, and expected social routines. And that is why. Second, language literacy acquisition. It is beneficial for ELL students to learn academic subjects in their primary language. Their primary language, okay? The added benefit is that learning subjects in their primary language can actually help their English development. They will be able to translate words and concepts back and forth from their primary to their secondary language. And this will help obtain higher levels of understanding. Additionally, if these students have strong literacy skills in their primary language, learning English will be easier. Is it easier for ELL students who read in their first language to learn to read in English? Well, yes, because the process if is the same regardless of the language. The consent decree addresses the civil rights of ELL students. Foremost among those, the right to equal access to all education programs. In addressing these rights, the consent decree provides a structure that ensures the delivery of the comprehensive instruction to which, to which ELL students are entitled. Remember the consent decree addresses the civil rights of ELL students, okay? And equal access to all education programs. Remember that, okay? The consent decree addresses all of the following except, except this one, okay? The need for translators for ELL students on campus, okay? Although translating could be part of an accommodation for an ELL student, schools are not required to have translators for each individual ELL student on campus. I mean, that's impossible. Imagine how many translators they would have to hire. That's ridiculous, okay? So, anyway, but it addresses all the following. Equal and fair education for all students. Teachers need specific training to teach ELL students. An evaluation system that measures the ELL programs against standard programs. It includes all that, but it doesn't include this, okay? It doesn't include D right here. Differentiation for ELL students. Differentiation for ELL students is unique. According to Reading Rockets, teachers need to accomplish a few goals in differentiating curriculum. First, we learn the culture, language, and background of each student. Have high expectations for students. Additionally, use their learning styles to find the right instruction and lesson plan that will fit their individual need and strength. Differentiation for ELL students look like multi-sensory instruction. Differentiation use, uses the multiple learning styles for each, for each child. That's right. A strong teacher will create a few ways of teaching and practicing the same concept so students have multiple opportunities to understand the concept, okay? There's many different ways to teach something. If I want to teach a student about how to make this blanket, well, I'm going to figure out as many ways as possible so the student can grasp the concept of how to make this blanket, okay? That's, you know find as many ways as they can learn, visual, oral, uh, hands-on, whatever the way, okay? That's differentiating instruction. Curriculum should be easily differentiated, highly 
individualize and include materials available for small group instruction and time for collaboration with professional peers. <clears throat> Accommodations for ELL students. ELL students, so that ELL is English, English language learners, English language learners, that's ELL. ELL students have a few options for accommodations. Some that are more scaffolded than others. For example, these students may be offered extended time or small group setting, taking the test in a small group with students they are comfortable with, could contribute to higher success. Additionally, the test administrator could read the questions out loud offer the test questions more than once, or even translate the test questions. Finally, the option is available for these students to respond to the questions in their primary language. This is where we left off in last video. Okay, what are accommodations for ELL students, English language learner students? Well, Accommodations for ELL students may include read alouds, translator questions, extended time, small group testing. All of these choices are appropriate testing accommodations for English language learner students. And now we start with 8.1, the National Reading Panel. In the year 2000, it released its now well-known report on teaching children to read. This report put to rest the debate between phonics and whole language. It essentially argued that word letter recognition is as important as understanding what the text means. The report's big five Critical areas of reading instruction are explained in the following section or sections. The big five, what are those? Well, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, comprehension, and vocabulary. Miss James is seated with a child by her side. The child is reading aloud from an open book. Miss James is teaching in a school that has embraced the balanced literacy approach. Therefore, it is most likely that Miss James is recording what? The child errors and miscues. The balanced literacy approach uses several methods to help children develop their reading skills, including guided reading, as Miss James is doing right here. Guided reading gives the, gives the teacher the opportunity to observe individual students' particular struggles so that he or she can develop a strategy for improvement. The Big Five. Phonemic awareness. What is that? It is the acknowledgement of sounds and words. It can be thought with the eyes closed. It is all about understanding sounds, not ascribing written letters to sounds. So phonemic awareness, you keep your eyes closed and you listen. Okay, phonics, the connection between sounds and the letters on a page. So for these, you need to have your eyes open because you're going to see fluency, reading connected pieces of text. That's how you become a fluent reading, a fluent reader. Comprehension, ascribe meaning to text and vocabulary. Students will be better at comprehension if they have stronger working vocabularies. 
Mr. Sanchez is having his students work with one-syllable words, removing the first consonant and substituting another, as in changing mats to hats. What reading skill are they working on? Or well, they're working on phonemic awareness, okay? With the eyes closed, remember? Phonemic awareness is the acknowledgement of sounds and words. A child's realization that some words rhyme is one of the skills that fall under this category. Common methods of teaching instruction. Well, summarization, question answering, question generating, graphic organizers, text structure, monitoring, uh, monitoring comprehension, textual marking and discussion. They're all common methods of teaching instruction. They're common. <clears throat> when a student uses sticky notes to make comments or ask questions while reading a book, they are using the following reading comprehension strategy. It's called textual marking. Which of the following techniques is overused in the classroom and is good and is a good one too? Question answering. The technique of question answer is useful for comprehension. That's right. Um, why would a teacher have a large group discussion about a text? To share opinions and discuss personal connections. Large group discussion can provide opportunities for students to share personal connections and opinions which will help students to make connections across the text and further comprehend the material. Critical thinking skills. Okay, remember these three. Analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Okay, critical thinking skills. Analysis is the systematic exploration of a concept, event, term, piece of writing, element of media, or any other complex item. Synthesis is the opposite of analysis. Taking different things and making them one whole thing. Evaluation is just making judgments and seeking opinions. <clears throat> Which of the following is an example of evaluating of an evaluating question according to Bloom's new taxonomy? Evaluating question. Well, propose an alternative to. Okay? Propose. There are six levels to this taxonomy. Remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating, which is the highest on, Bloom, on Bloom's taxonomy. Evaluating is compiling information together to make a judgment or propose an alternative solution. Propose. Okay. You got that, boy? Yes, you hope you do. Okay. Um, in Bloom's old taxonomy, he used the word synthesis. Now, in the new taxonomy, it is referred to as evaluate. Evaluating falls into the same spot as synthesis did in the old Bloom's taxonomy. <clears throat> Over the last few decades, research has confirmed that students do not all learn in the same way. Duh, of course they don't learn in the same way. They're all different people. A steady routine of lecture and textbook reading is an extremely ineffective method of instruction and it's boring too. Some possibilities outside of the realm of lecture include textual and media references, hands-on materials, and technology. Use everything you can. Don't be a boring instructor, okay? How can DVDs be used in instruction? Well, students can use DVDs to review concepts studied. Personal computers can be useful for all the following except discover and learn social media. 
social media such as Facebook or Instagram is not an academic need and does not belong in the school environment. Of course, that's duh. <clears throat> 8.6, let's see. Differentiation of instruction. When a teacher varies the content, process, or product used in instruction, content, process, product, the specific to what uh, is learned, that's contact. Process, the route to learning, the contact. Product, the result of the learning. Two keys for successful differentiation, knowing what is essential in the curriculum, knowing the needs of the students. At last, differentiation should be fun. The idea behind differentiation is to reach the students and their unique learning style. The more interesting and engaging the lesson, the more the students will learn. Divergent questions. Which of the following should a teacher consider when planning questions for a whole group discussion? Effective teachers ask more divergent questions. In general, active classroom discourse is promoted best by the use of divergent, open-ended questions. Divergent thinking. How many ways can a person travel from San Francisco to Washington, D.C.? You see this type of question? Well, this question right here stimulates students' divergent thinking because they have to figure out, okay, how many ways? Oh, I can go uh, from San Francisco to Washington. I can use a train. I can use a plane. I can use a horse, a skateboard, rollerblade, a bicycle. Uh, uh, I can go running, walking, whatever. They have to come up with ways. I can go in a taxi. I can go, you know, um, whatever. You know, they, they, they come up with different solutions. So... That is stimulating students' divergent thinking, okay? You need to ask more divergent questions as a teacher to stimulate students to think, you know? And when you stimulate students to think, they learn. Divergent thinking have a, uh, have a diversity of answers, none of which is described as the right answer. Exactly. You know, there's many, many answers to that type of question like that. Task analysis. That's for the teachers right here. An advantage of using task analysis when planning a lesson is gaining increased awareness of the sub skills students need for mastering more advanced skills and yes this is my handwriting and i am a left-handed person so yeah i got a neat handwriting the massachusetts law of 1647 generally known as the old deluder satan act it is significant because it helped lay the foundation for compulsory education in America. And I do remember that. Uh, come on. There you go. All right. CALP. What is CALP? Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency. To develop CALP, or Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, in an optimal second language learning environment takes most ESOL learners an average of five to seven years. Okay, cognitive academic language, not the social language, academic, five to seven years, okay? An acronym, ah, oh, that's easy. Uh, for example, using the word homes to remember the names of the Great Lakes, see? Homes, well, you got Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, Superior. Homes, that's an acronym, okay? Using it as a mnemonic device, something like that. 
During a class discussion, for which of the following purposes would it be appropriate for a teacher to ask a closed end question? Well, to check for agreement among the students. Okay, you don't need a whole bunch of answers. You need agreement among the students. Well, you use a closed end question. Okay. Best strategy for developing a fourth grade student's reading fluency. Encourage the student to reread books written at the student's independent reading level. Independent reading level. That's the best strategy for developing a fourth grade student's reading fluency. Independent reading level. Encourage them to reread books. A teacher's main purpose for having a class debate about a controversial community issue is to engage students in higher order thinking in authentic context. Again, what is a teacher's main purpose for having a class debate about a controversial community issue? Well, it is to engage students in higher order thinking in authentic context. Why is it authentic? Controversial community issue. That's why. That's the main purpose for the class debate. Community issue. Okay, you got it. Anyway, uh, let's go to the next one. During the colonial period of the 1600s, children in New England were taught the alphabet and beginning reading almost exclusively in Dane schools. And that was right. In regular education classrooms, academic tasks that are assigned as classwork or homework are typically based upon low context and high cognitive demand. The 1943 landmark case, West Virginia State Board of Education v. Vernet is significant because the court ordered that schools are prohibited from requiring students to participate in flag salutes. I pledge allegiance to the flag for the United States of America and da 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 da, stuff like that, you know. So, 1943, West Virginia State Board of Education, Vivernet. Remember, Vivernet, Board of Education. Schools are prohibited from requiring students to participate in flag salutes. A major motivational reason to. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me read that again. A major motivational reason. Comparative learning produces positive instructional outcomes is the, well, of course, the cooperative incentive structure. That's what it motivates them, okay? That's what motivates them. Uh, i got to fix my English, okay? A student who exhibits a cognitive style that is right brain dominant is likely to learn best through instruction based on visual and kinesthetic global activities. I am a left-handed person. That means I use the right side of my brain, the opposite, okay? So I'm more inclined, I am, I am this, I am more of a visual and kinesthetic global uh, learner. You know, I I am more on this side. So this this one is describing me. A right-handed person uses the left side of the brain. That type of person is more like for uh, you know working in an office. Uh, they're more inclined to mathematics and science. Um, a left-handed person, which uses the right brain, is more inclined to. Uh, art, singing, dancing, physical education, any sport, that's me, okay? 
So, that's that. And let me stop the video right here. After a science experiment, a high school teacher asks students to respond to, a, to the following two prompts. Justify the results of your experiment. Formulate a theory based on the results of your experiments. The major benefit to students from this assignment is that it of course, it promotes their critical and creative thinking skills because it's telling them to justify, formulate, okay? A student who scores at the 80th percentile on a standardized achievement test has scored the same as or better than 80% of a norm group. Okay, that's what actually that means. Inductive reasoning. Okay, in giving students problems in which they must generalize an algebraic or geometric pattern, a mathematics teacher is most likely promoting students' use of inductive reasoning. So, when you give a student problems in which they must generalize an algebraic or geometric pattern, the mathematics teacher is likely promoting the use of inductive reasoning. A fifth grade student has a grade equivalent score of 7.6 on a standardized reading test. The student's grade equivalent score indicates that the student did as well on the test as an average seventh grader in the six month of the school year would do on the same standardized reading test that the fifth grade student took. Okay, so the fifth grade student took a test and he did as well as an average seventh grader in the sixth month of the school year. Okay. A kindergarten teacher has her students sitting in a circle on the carpet while she passes around a bag containing plastic letters. Each student is to reach in the bag, remove a letter, show the letter to the group, and they and then they say the name of the letter and its sound. What concept is the teacher working on with these children? Alphabetic principle. That's what she's working on. B.F. Skinner. Yeah, behaviorism. Remember Skinner? Behaviorism. He was the foremost proponent of behaviorism in the United States. Booker T. Washington. He was the leading advocate of vocational education for African Americans. Booker T. Washington, vocational education for African Americans. That's him. Booker T. Washington. Okay. By the 2010-2011 school year, the maximum number of students in core curricular courses assigned to a teacher will be as follows. From pre-K to third grade, 18 students, the max. From fourth to eighth grade, 22 students from 9 to 12th grade 25 students okay that's the maximum mr abraham maslow maslow's hierarchy of needs he has the physiological safety belongingness and love needs esteem and self actualization and it goes by order first 
by um, in the order of importance this is the first and that's the last okay so the first physiological needs food and shelter safety needs security and order belongingness and love needs affection affiliation with others affection and affiliation with others esteem needs self-respect worthiness self-actualization needs self-fulfillment and personal achievement and that's everybody wants to achieve that but everything else but must be met jacob s conan he asserted the difference between successful and unsuccessful classroom managers successful classroom managers were proactive in preventing disruptions before they occurred unlike unsuccessful classroom managers that's jacob s conan conan's specific classroom managers management skills with itness when you have with itness you are aware of what is happening at all times overlapping that's multitasking group alerting keeping your students attention momentum keep instruction moving at a brisk pace smoothness smooth transitions exploiting the ripple effect that's the phenomenon the phenomenon that occurs for example when a teacher reminds an off-task student to get back to work and all the other students also return to the assigned i mean to their assigned tasks that's exploiting the ripple effect preparing a brief statement that contains the essential ideas of a longer passage or selection is called summarizing so formative assessment occurs before and during instruction summative assessment used to determine students academic achievement for the purpose of grades authentic assessments incorporate real life application tasks inductive reasoning is the process of drawing a general conclusion based on one or more examples reasoning from specific to general is inductive reasoning now deductive reasoning is the process of using an accepted rule to draw a conclusion about a specific example reasoning from general to specific is called deductive reasoning got that I'll stop there. Here we go. In giving students problems in which they must draw a general conclusion based on a number of examples, a mathematics teacher is most likely promoting students' use of what? I'll let you answer first. Yeah, yeah. Inductive reasoning. Remember general conclusion they must draw a general conclusion therefore they're promoting a use of inductive reasoning reasoning from specific to general is called inductive reasoning okay check this little thing right here inductive reasoning from specific to general deductive reasoning from general to specific okay so this is inductive inductive is going up this way deductive is going down this way okay so inductive you start off supporting data facts i mean supporting data facts examples and evidence then you go to main points and you make a conclusion see so from specific all the way up to general that's inductive the whole opposite is from general to specific that will be 
deductive, doing the whole thing the opposite way. Okay? That's how it, that's another explanation. A little graphic. All right. Mm -hmm. McKinney Vento Act, 2001, 2003. Okay? Required that, uh, required districts to provide access to a free and appropriate education to homeless children. McKinney Vento Act, remember them? Has to do with homeless children. Okay? McKinney Vento Act, homeless children. Require districts to provide access to a free and appropriate education to homeless children. The PL 94142 Education of All Handicapped Children Act of 1975, a year before I was born, it mandated that children with disabilities are entitled to a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. Brown v. Topeka Board of Education, 1954. Okay. It banned the practice of racial segregation in schools, striking down the notion of separate but equal schooling. The principle of separation of church and state was established by the ratification of the Bill of Rights. Which of the following is the primary purpose of having students develop portfolios? Well, to provide a means for students to self-assess. Students in a social studies class have been researching the history of the U.S. flag and the Pledge of Allegiance. One student comments, my father said that the school can make us say the Pledge of Allegiance if we don't want to. The student parent is, well, he is correct, based on Supreme Court decision, stating that no student can be compelled to salute the flag, remember, based on Supreme Court decision. Oh, these are little uh, acronyms right here. You got BICS, Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills, CALP, Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, ELL, English, Lang English Language Learner, ESE, Exceptional Student Education, <clears throat> ESOL is English for Speakers of Other Languages. LEP, Limited English Proficient. LER, Limited English Reader. LES, Limited English Speaker. NEP, Non-English Proficient. Okay. What is LY? LY is LEP students enrolled in classes designed for LEP students. LN, LEP students not enrolled in classes designed for LEP students. LF, LEP students who exited the program within the last two years. LZ, LEP students who exited the program more than two years ago, and ZZ, non-LEP students. Those are little codes right there. And remember that LEP was right here, LEP, limited English proficient. That's what it meant. Okay. If a student is not fluent in reading, she will have difficulty, of course, comprehending, sounding out words, and would pause a lot. All of these issues will be highlighted when a child is not fluent in reading. 
which is why fluency is such an important skill to focus on. Phonemic awareness, ability to notice, think about, and work with the individual sounds in spoken words. Phonemes, smallest part of sound in a spoken word. For example, the first phoneme of the word cat is the sound that the C makes. K -k 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 -k. Phonics instruction teaches the student the relationship between the letters and their individual sounds. And that's the end of that. Bye-bye.